Welcome to Looptopia. I know where we've been, right? We're building our own utopian homestead. If you've never been with us before, we have a little uh, plant-based homestead out in South Carolina that we're building from raw land. So we have been gone because we have been shuttling stuff from the north to the south and we're trying to collect everything in one homestead. I have a partner. She is off screen. Her name is Lorelai. She doesn't like to be on film, but you will hear her voice chime in. So you are not hearing an angel in your head. <laughs> it's actually her. We are um, going to give you guys a little update. So what's going on? So we went to New Hampshire, which is where uh, we used to snowbird like back and forth. And I lived in New Hampshire a long time. I was with this Free State project. And we, uh, we lived up there and we decided to come to South Carolina because we felt like with what's coming that it would be better to be in a place that was cheaper. Like the land was much less expensive than the north. And we can and actually find some. The vegetables are more less expensive <laughs> and everything's less expensive. Um, and yeah, and we could find some because we looked in New Hampshire actively for about two years and, and just could not find anything to fit our needs. So like you guys, most of you guys are watching either homestead or want a homestead or you just want to get enough away where you can be left alone and grow your own food. And because of zoning laws and a lot of government, it is getting harder and harder to do that. So the answer now, when people are like, how do you guys live like this? It's, you're gonna have to move to where people don't really wanna be necessarily. You're not, you're gonna need to move out of areas that are zoned because it's, it's just too hard to fight that mess. Now, I, we For live, what we're gonna do. Where we live, it's in the middle of nowhere. There's really nothing no. around. We purposely moved. And we did it on purpose. Yeah, and, and if you look into your state or you talk to some realtors, there are, still some rural in every state there's still some rural land that is completely unzoned and that's kind of what you want to do because we're building unconventional things and i just don't want to deal with you know having to deal with that mess and it's getting harder and harder if you live near a suburbs or city so as we keep saying you don't really want to be in those areas anyway if you can avoid it because um for financial reasons and for shortages reasons and just cities are just and a, like a it's good really place to be. I mean, uh, I mean, I get if your life's there and your job's there and you're stuck there, but you might want to consider transitioning out of that because we were talking to our friend Nikki Sunshine and she's like, you know, talk to the folks about being self-reliant, independent. And a lot of that is going to depend on how much the government gets in your way. Uh, we have a second little tiny home, not a tiny home, but a small little like condo thing where we have an HOA and it sucks. It sucks so bad. We Again, get what? At least a letter a month? Yeah. We're <laughs> like, always in trouble. They're always mad at us for something. And you can't even grow anything here. Like only certain trees and only certain, um, certain stuff. Like, you know, you, you, we can't even have a garden in the back really. You have to put it all in pots, which we, is... We can't have a shed. You have you to know, have a fence to have a shed and... The whole thing is a nightmare. And we would have never, ever, ever, ever move into an HOA, but this was an inherited house. So it's like, uh, okay, we'll deal with it for right now, but where we focus all of our attention is out at the homestead. So we have a homestead about an hour outside of this house that I'm speaking to you from. And the homestead, it, when we bought it, it's just kind of like raw land. There was very little there. We had to pour a road in, um, we had to develop a garden, we had to bring, it was just a big lump of clay. The soil was all the wrong stuff, so we've had to deal with that. And while we, we didn't experiment last year, we were also kind of really concerned because we were hearing crazy food shortages, things were starting to happen, things were getting hard to get. And we're like, we better grow and do a test run of everything we can grow. So we decided to grow survival food first. We pretty much just went right to potatoes and peanuts and things kind of like high density foods. And we put some, uh, we brought some first year fruit trees. There's no fruit trees on the property at all. So we brought some fruit trees in 
and we were messing with all that trying to experiment what will grow and what doesn't and unfortunately I haven't really found too many local people that'll be like oh that's a good thing to grow and that's a good thing to grow we have a few local friends that I'm kind of I'm gonna go steal some of their plants as far as you know like take clippings so I know a few things that'll grow and but I'm doing a lot of traditional stuff like in the south sweet potatoes peanuts um, you know things that go hot uh, muscadine grapes which you know, went crazy well we our muscadine gone. went good our, our southern cherry tree surprise was amazing looking and our olive tree and the which, yeah the olive trees went weird but we are going to um, winterize a lot of these because we have a few citrus trees too some uh, we have some grapefruit, grapefruit and, and mandarin little, oranges. Little oranges so we're gonna bring them into the greenhouse for the winter and what we did is we bought one of those cheapy greenhouses on Amazon. It was like 300 bucks, but it's pretty big. It's, I think it's like 10 by 20. And um, it should be enough just to keep the temperature and the, the frost and the wind is, is what will kill a citrus tree. And if we have to, we might bury it under a bunch of straw just to keep it warm. We'll see if we have to go to that degree. Uh, I will keep you informed with videos at every step of the way. We are going to get very active. And I apologize because we're in our Telegram group and people are like, yeah, you guys don't talk about homesteading anymore. All you do is talk about other stuff. And that is true because we were gone for four months this year, almost five. And we decided to do what was neglect gardening, where we had a friend come by to watch the property for safety, come by every day and make sure everything's, you know, neighbors watching our stuff. But the actual watering and the all that, it's kind of on its own. It's gone wild. And my idea was what's called neglect gardening, which is you find things that grow so good that you can't kill them. Things like, you know, weeds, um, like dandelions. You don't have to worry about watering dandelions. You know, they just, they just live they no matter where you so you want to find food like that, like some um, some blackberries, very invasive. That no matter what you do, you burn it and chop it out of the ground, and it'll come back. Those are the kind of things you want for food that grow food. Um, and I'm trying to experiment to find those sort of things. So if you guys are in zone eight, we are in zone eight A B. We're right on the. We're supposed to be eight B, but we might be eight A. It's, it's, it's on the line. line. It's on the line. Um, we are, some of the sun here is brutal, so we're probably going to plant in the shade next year to see what will happen. I, I'm, I'm yeah, I did not, I did not realize how intense the sun was. Just cooked our blueberries. Um, we lost a few plants just because I wasn't, I didn't realize, you know, I'm, I'm used to the north where you can just put blueberries in the sun. You don't have to worry about them frying. Well, apparently you can't do that down south. Um, and you know, I, I have grown in Savannah before, but even... Savannah to South Carolina seems to be a difference. It seems to be hotter here some ways. I don't know why, but... So I'm still playing with varieties and all that. And so I wanted to tell you guys what happened. So we were like three or four days to coming home. And all of a sudden we get notices all about Ivan. Ian. Oh, Ian. Ian. I keep saying Hurricane Ivan. Ian K Hurricane Ian. And Hurricane Ian was um, a surprise. Because Myrtle Beach, so we're right in Myrtle Beach, doesn't really get hurricanes. It's super rare. Everything it that, kind of it, seems to skip this place. Yeah, it's kind of like in a cove, and because of the the trade winds and the way the the water shelf is, some reason it's like this protected bubble. So it's really rare when it gets hit by a hurricane. And this hurricane was weird. I'm just going to say that you read between the lines there that I it felt like it had an intelligence where it wiped out Florida, turned around and then turned right into South Carolina, um, which is, is a strange pattern for it to do. I think it's uh, the way it hit and what so we, we, we get ready and we're, we're like practically on our way and we find out about Ian and we had left some tents up because we were still doing water collection. We wanted to come back to full water when we came, you know, it was a good opportunity to collect water while we we're gone. And we, we have gutters on the tents to collect the water. So we were like, oh man, every tent is gonna be just ripped to shreds. 
but we stake our tents down extra strong. We have um, like ratchet ties, tie downs, going to those dog screws, you know those screws that you stick in the ground where you would put a dog leash on? So each corner is, is held down by that instead of just like an average pop-up tent where they just give you a few stakes. We use dog screws and anchor them, and uh, everything survived. I can't believe it. Not one bit of damage. We thought the tents would just be shredded. Everything survived. You thought the tents would be shredded. I did, yeah. My, you were super worried. My girls got a lot more faith. <laughs> well, we seem to be well, in a protective coat. In this, so where our land is, it seems to be a bubble. Like, every storm that's hit, it's never really, it's kind of skittered around the edge. We just haven't gotten any real, like... We'll go out and there'll be tree branches everywhere coming in, but on our area, it just doesn't really seem to hit. We also have a, um, our acreage, so we have 10 acres, and maybe two of it's cleared. So we have a bunch of trees surrounding our area, which I do think helps cut oh, the wind. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. We're not just sitting in a field, you know. So uh, hopefully that helped a little bit. Alrighty. So for you guys that were worried about Ian, and I was definitely worried about it, uh, we seem to be okay. We missed it, but... What happened, though, <laughs> with four months of complete neglect? I had forgotten how quickly the South takes the land back. It was unrecognizable. We had trees growing. like In our potato patch, there were full-grown trees already. What, like, what were they? like? Uh, oh, I forgot what they're called, but they're these... I'll show it to you on the video. Like so, a mimosa tree, I think it, is what they said. It kind of looks like one. A mimosa tree, yeah. These things grew so fast. It was like jungle fast. And... Um, ants moved all back in. I'm going to have to deal with the ants out there. Ugh. You know, I could make peace with some ants, but these are fire ants, and they are They're jerks. Massively destructive. They eat all the beneficial bugs. Yeah, they, they wipe everything they, out. And actually eat all the bacteria off the roots of your plants and kill them. A lot of people don't realize that they'll set up on your roots of your plants, and people are like, oh, well, they just eat your roots and kill it. It's also that they create bunches of tunnels around the roots and the air gets in and roots aren't supposed to have full blown air. It, it kills them. So they usually end up dying because of all the aeration. Uh, and they deplete the soil. Yeah. They kind of make it just, healthy soil. They're just jerks. So I wish I could make some sort of peace with them. We also got hit by some voles. Uh, what are they called? Field voles? They look like little ground uh, dogs. Meadow mice. Meadow, or... meadow voles or something. Yeah, meadow mice. They're... These little groundhog looking things and they dug up every sweet potato that was not in a raised bed all the ones that were in the the uh, grow bags survived but everything in the ground well there were slips in the grow bags and actual yeah. grew them sprouted out of the potato in the so they they could sense it uh, they, knew. they were after it that being said we're basically going although we had a few interesting things happen that we found out one, regular potatoes, nothing really ate those. We had some potato bugs maybe that ate some of the leaves, but nothing really killed the potatoes. I saw what was nibbling on, you know, we saw the stalks, there's a couple of them where yeah. they were stripped. It was grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are eating the potato leaves? Just a couple. Hmm, I didn't even know they did There was that. maybe out of the hundred plants that are out there, I saw it on maybe three of them. Okay, so we didn't get too much damage, but what was interesting is this. We, I had this theory and the Irish do this with their potatoes. A lot of people pull their potatoes up and store them and then wait a few months and then they put them back in the ground and grow them again. And I was like, what if we just leave them in the ground? Because that's how nature would do it. They would just go dormant and then grow again and go dormant and grow again. And if you're warm enough and they the don't secret is- really go dormant, they grow well, again. We have clay soil. So we had to amend the soil enough that it could drain. And I think the secret is, you know, you can't let your potatoes get too wet and or they'll rot. I think the grow bags are the secret because they drain. When we came back in the middle of the summer with that big load of stuff, all of the potatoes and the so when we left, all of them, all the plants had died out. They'd finished their cycle and we're done. Mm -hmm. And we just left them in there just to see what was going to happen with them. And when we came back in the middle of summer, what, like two months later? Two and a yeah. half months later? We checked it in like in two months. They all had plants growing in them again. 
So the way, if you guys have never grown potatoes, what happens is there are most potatoes are around 100 days and they die and they reabsorb all that green stuff into the tuber, you know, and you'll be like, what did I do wrong? All of a sudden, all my potatoes just keeled over. That's what they're supposed to do. So when they die, you usually that the way you can tell is that you let them go brown and you wait two weeks. Kind of the standard is two weeks to get the maximum size potato. It takes a, a few extra days for it to absorb everything out. And you should get to the point where you could just walk through and kind of break off the dead stems. And that's when you know it's okay to harvest your potatoes. So potatoes don't like hot weather. So what you're looking at is they will grow in the spring and they will grow in the fall down here. Um, if you can get 100 days in the spring and you get 100 days in the fall without getting frozen out, you can have two sets of potatoes. You can double your potatoes. Well, we actually decided to just leave them in the ground and see if they would come up again on their own. And it looks like they are. And I will give an update. Did we just double our potatoes without having to do any extra work? It really looks like. Did. Or maybe even tripled because all those are going to be more and more plants. Or they're going to eventually run out of nutrients and choke that that bag out. But the ones in the grow bags and some of them in the ground are still in, but they just got overrun by weeds. So we're going to completely redesign stuff. Um, I think we're going to go a lot more technical as far as uh, putting actual weed berries down and putting things in grow bags and raising them up just for the simple ease of not fighting the bug and weed pressure out here. I didn't want to go that way because it's much cheaper to just do like wide rows and tear your ground up. And I still, we, we still might do part of that, but I think over the winter, why everything's died back, we're going to drastically redo the garden. I think so. Yeah. So. Here's our plans, so I'll let you guys go, but here's here's what we got coming up, and the videos will start coming in. We will be out there most of our time working. In the winter, we plan on redoing the garden. We plan on building a few different aircrete styrofoam structures. So it's not just aircrete, it's aircrete mixed with styrofoam. And we hope to make a few sheds and maybe even a place to stay. And uh, putting the wall tent up. We'll be putting, you know, we'll be messing around with the wall tent. We'll be installing uh, wood, stove. wood stove. I'll be making a much bigger water filtration system and a better water catch. And we're going to try to figure out if I can do that on, um, I want to put it all on a gravity feed so we don't have to rely on doing it manually or pumps. But that means you have to raise everything really high up. So we're going to have some fun with that. We're probably also going to redo the conics and insulate part of it so we can store like our potatoes and the food in there that we actually grow. We're going to make it a, um, we're going to use aircrete inside and cast it around the walls. And like then, a refrigeration Yeah, room. like a refrigeration unit sort of without all the... Like a temperature controlled room in the back of the conics. An off-grid, an off-grid uh, root cellar. Yeah, and we, who can't knows? Really do, we can't really do a root cellar here because the water table is so high. We, I, we don't know. Because when we dug our well, we hit water at 12 feet. But who knows if it's there all year round? Like, is it well, go up to seven feet? Does it feet matter? Or six feet? We can't. Because if it does, we could do some sort of sunken, sunken room. Maybe. But if we could go four or five feet in the ground. That one time a year, you would have that leak. So yeah, and that's what I don't on. know. Unless you can seal it well. I, I mean, we could tr treat it like a basement. And, seal it real well but i don't know i i'm not against growing going underground but that will be later i think what we're going to do is we are basically going to make above ground root cellars we're going to make super thick air crate insulation so the r value is like 40 and 50. Uh, it'll be basically like living in a cave uh those are our plans this winter again if you are plant-based basically means vegan and you're looking for a homestead come contact us there's some uh you come talk to us on telegram where if that's your vibe if not and you're doing your own homestead or you just wanted to learn just stick with us and you can watch all uh, the stuff we do but we are looking for uh just a few more people that are interested in coming to help out and build this place i think it's going to be a very fun and active winter so stick with us we should be uh, doing a lot of cool projects coming up you have anything else you want to add i don't think so 
All right. Well, until then, guys, take care of each other. We'll get through this and, uh, you know, start getting ready. Love y'all. Bye. Whoops, I forgot something. We will mostly be putting our stuff on Odyssey and Brighteon because it's uncensored there. If you're watching through YouTube, you're only getting maybe half our information because we, we can't speak freely here. Everything is uh, struck down and censored. So please follow us there. You'll find descriptions in the link. Until then, you know, what are you doing on YouTube? Get off YouTube. Bye. <laughs>